This is Michael Popak, and by the looks of things, it's time for Legal AF After Dark. Judge Cannon getting very close to being reassigned from the case and having Jack Smith take her up on appeal all at the same time. Now she's decided to give a homework assignment to both the defense and the special counsel in the Mar-a-Lago case, but it's based on a fallacy. It's based on her misapprehension, Judge Cannon's misunderstanding of the law. She thinks the Presidential Records Act provides some sort of defense to Donald Trump and his um, uh, the crimes that he's been charged with under the Espionage Act and the Obstruction Act, which they do not. And Jack Smith, the special counsel, has told her so in no uncertain terms in a new brief that he's filed, which is the precursor to him bringing the appeal against her, cataloging all of her errors in the case, and asking for her reassignment. We talk about it all at one place on the Midas Touch Network, a show we call Legal AF. Take a listen. And uh, let's just uh, take a a quick uh, drive down to where I'm at now, (laughs) down in Florida, and talk about Judge Cannon. You did an amazing uh, interview today, I thought it was, with CNN. Why don't you take the lead on that, frame it, and then I'll I'll give my little two cents in, and we'll wrap up our podcast for tonight. So it's Judge Eileen Cannon did what many judges do ahead of, or at the very kind of right before trial, ahead of, ahead of the trial, which is give me your proposed jury instructions. Because at the end of a case, what a judge does is a judge will say to the, to the jury, okay, you've been asked to, you've heard all the evidence, you've heard summations. Now you are asked to render a verdict on the following charges. And let me read you the elements of each of those offenses. And the, the the charging of the jury is what it's called, can sometimes take hours. It's a very long process. It's methodical where the judge literally instructs the jury on the law because the lawyers aren't allowed to tell the jurors what the law is. And so the judge is the only one who's allowed to say this is the law. And, and they talk about the elements of the statute and the definitions of different words. And you sit there and you listen to each and every, uh, every, every definition, every element that the the people have to prove or the government has to prove each and every element of each and every crime beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's that's how it works. And it's a unanimous uh, verdict that you have to have in criminal cases. And I remember as a prosecutor, you, you finish your case, you get all the evidence in, you know, you're listening to the charge and you just, you, you shake your head and you're like, oh, beyond a reasonable doubt of every one of these elements, did I do it? You know, it's nerve wracking. So, so judges often will ask the lawyers for their proposed jury instructions. And what they'll say is, get together, see what you agree on, you know, what, what, what charges do you want? What jury instructions do you want? See what you agree on and point out what you don't agree on. And there are some some very standard jury instructions that, that people don't necessarily engage in that, you know, it's going to happen. And you focus on the ones that, that you, you want certain language to go and to go a certain way. And there's, there, there are model jury instructions. There's pattern jury instructions. There's, there's jury instructions out there that you can draw from. So you don't normally, you don't make them up. You, you look and you see, okay, what has been said before? What's been upheld by the appellate courts before is the appropriate language. Sometimes jury instructions, sometimes cases get reversed because the wrong language of a jury instruction occurs. So the court here asked the, the, um, the parties to, engage with two competing scenarios and offer alternative draft text that assumes each scenario to be correct formulation of the law to be issued to the jury. So essentially said, I'm going to give you a hypothetical and I want you to give draft jury and select jury uh, charge language. And I have to say, when I read the statute, when I read the, when I read her two hypotheticals, I, Popak, I had to go back and I started questioning my own ability as a lawyer. I started thinking, do I not understand the law? I don't, I, I studied this. Not only did I go to law school, we all, in preparation for all these legal AFs, we read every single decision. We read every single filing. We study the law. We study cases. And these hypotheticals were so far afield of what my understanding and interpretation of the law is that I couldn't understand how she got to these two hypotheticals. So it wasn't either or, it was neither. 
And so I looked at that and I thought, what the heck? And I know you did and Ben did too as well, because it was so outrageous that she thought that the law was the way she said it was. I'll, I'll, I'll go into more detail in a second. You know, I, I think she was, I think she showed two things. A, inexperience, because there's no way that an experienced judge would do what she did and think that it means what it means. But the other thing too, I started to think, because there was a, a while there that I thought, you know, she's so in the pocket of Donald Trump and trying to help him and, and you know, she should be recused from the case because of that. And there's a part of me that wondered in this particular instance, is she afraid of Donald Trump? Because th there is no other explanation for why she would pose the hypotheticals in this way, because it was it was that egregious. And essentially what she said was, it was both of these scenarios had to do with a legal premise that what Jack Smith last night in a, in a late night filing called fundamentally flawed legal premise. Jack Smith came out with a scathing, scathing uh, motion about this hypothetical scenario. And he said, essentially that these scenarios are flawed because they she's basically says in them to determine whether a former president is authorized okay to determine under the presidential records act is this personal or is this presidential and again, I was like, the Presidential Records Act, what does that have to do with the Espionage Act? It's like she's conflating two different statutes, right? Presidential Records Act is its own statute, and it has to do with, at the end of a presidency, you know, go out and take out your love letters from Melania, from, you know, the nuclear codes and separate them out because you're going to want to take your Valentine's Day cards with you. Those aren't necessarily presidential unless, of course, your Valentine's Day card was given to you by Kim Jong-un. You know, that was considered a uh, presidential record um, because it has to do with your, your official job. It's not personal in nature. But she's saying the Presidential Records Act potentially allowed him to just decide what's personal and what's not, what's and what's and what he's allowed to keep. And so and so essentially, Jack Smith reoriented and tried to reorient orient Judge Cannon to say this is about the Espionage Act. And this is about the Espionage Act and the ability to possess highly classified documents, right? You're not allowed to possess them or store them in an unsecure facility. And that comes from an executive order. It's Executive Order 12526. And that's what governs possession of classified information. And Donald Trump is not charged with possessing all of those boxes and all of those records. He's charged with 34, right? That's what Jack Smith did. He carefully and surgically went through those boxes and said, okay, you weren't supposed to have some of these. Some of these would be a violation of the Presidential Records Act, but I'm not going to charge that. That has nothing to do with this case. I'm only focusing my case on, <clears throat> on the, the violations of the Espionage Act because that's what's really serious here, right? Is you possessing essentially our nuclear codes when you're not supposed to, and you refuse to give them back and you stored them in an unsecured facility. And so Jack Smith said in his filing, the legal premise is wrong and it would distort the trial and it would result in an acquittal, right? He said, either scenario judge is going to result in an acquittal because what you're saying is that Donald Trump, what you're asking us is to give you language to charge the jury that essentially says he can just declassify, he could just not declassify something. He could just determine in his mind that something is a president is a personal record or a presidential record. So of course they're going to say he decided that, right? Because that's what he's going to say. That's what his defense is going to be at trial if she gives that jury charge. And so what Jack Smith is saying, if you do that, you are putting this trial in jeopardy and you are essentially, because once a jury is sworn, okay, once you get pick a jury and the jury is sworn, something called jeopardy attaches. And those are magic words. That means that if there is an acquittal or a conviction, double jeopardy applies. The government doesn't get a do-over, okay? Especially if there's an acquittal, right? It's done forever. And so what he said was essentially by, by saying that the Presidential Records Act has, has 
applies here. And by asking for a jury charge regarding that, what you're doing, Judge, is you're making an acquittal almost certain. And because it would be after jeopardy attaches, you are we wouldn't be able to uh, appeal at the end. So what we're asking Judge Cannon, we're asking you to do is to promptly decide whether the unstated legal premise underlying your recent order represents the correct formulation of the law. If the court wrongly concludes that it does and needs to include the Presidential Records Act in the jury instructions, uh, please inform the parties well in advance of trial so the government can consider appealing before Jeopardy attacks, attaches. They also said, Jack Smith also says, quote, the adoption of a clearly erroneous jury instruction that entails a high probability of failure of a prosecution, right? An acquittal, that's a failure of a prosecution. Uh, a failure the government couldn't then seek to remedy by appeal constitutes the kind of extraordinary situation which empowers to issue a writ of mandamus. So, the two scenarios that the court was asking Jack Smith to consider, right, or both parties to consider, was scenario A, uh, the courts in the court's order, this would be the charge, right? Um, in the court's order that the Espionage Act, a former president is authorized to possess any document that the jury determines qualifies as a personal record as defined by the Presidential Records Act that would wrongly present to the jury a factual determination that should have no legal consequence under the elements of Section 793. Likewise, if the court concludes, as posited in scenario B, that a president has carte blanche to remove any document from the White House at the end of his presidency, that any document so must so removed must be treated as personal under the Presidential Records Act as an unreviewable matter of law, and that also as a matter of law, a former president is forever authorized to possess such a document, regardless of how highly classified it may be and how it is stored, that would constitute a, quote, clearly erroneous jury instruction that entails a high probability of failure. And so the government must be provided with an opportunity to seek prompt appellate review. As I said, it's normal to discuss in advance uh, jury selections, but Cannon did Jack Smith a favor, frankly, by signaling her wrongness or her, her, th this, this erroneous uh, jury selection. If she had waited until the end to do it, that would have been fatal to the case. So part of me was like, why did she do, if she was really in the bag for Trump, why did she do this in advance? And I, that's why I think maybe she's just scared of Trump. And so she's trying to maybe get off the case because this is going to get her recused from the case finally. So it was very interesting to me to, to, to see this motion. So, so what, what, what Jack Smith did is he said, look, let me give you instead the well-supported jury instruction for the elements of Section 793 of, you know, the Espionage Act. Let's talk about the plain language of the statute. Let's talk about the language of Executive Order 13526, which implements the regulations of the Espionage Act. And he basically said, look, you know, you're, you're trying to propose this as a defense, but this is not a defense that is allowed and it's made up, and it was made up a, at least a year after you possessed these documents. Jack Smith says, look, you were in negotiations with the National Archives for a long time, asking the National Archives, you know, talking about these documents. You never once said, these are personal, personal records. I'm allowed to keep it, you know? You didn't do that. This was a reliance on a, what he called it, a pro hoc justification con concocted more than a year after he left the White House. And by doing that, He's actually, uh, he's actually basically making this up later after the fact. He also says, he also calls Trump out and says he never represented to the court, okay? To this day, he's never represented to the court, that he in fact designated the classified documents as personal. He didn't say it in his motion to dismiss. He didn't say it in his reply. He didn't say it in the hearing on March 14th, 2024, just a few weeks ago, despite every opportunity to do so, despite every incentive to do so, he never did it. And so it does not apply. And let me just read for you what the Presidential Records Act says. It defines a personal record as any document of a purely private or non-public character, which does not relate to or have an effect upon the carrying out of the constitutional, statutory, or other official or ceremonial duties of the president. In fact, 
all the, so Jack Smith goes on to say, in fact, all the documents in the indictment are of a nature that make the straightforward, that make this straightforward, that these are not presidential records. It would be pure fiction to suggest that these highly classified documents, don't forget, Jack Smith only put in there highly classified secret important documents that were created by members of the intelligence community, created by the military, and presented to the president during his term in office. To say that's purely private and that they don't relate to or have an effect on his carrying out of the constitutional or statutory duties of the president just absolutely flies in the face of any just you you can't even make that argument with a straight face. Right. And you know, Jack Smith just eviscerates Donald Trump. He says your own representatives didn't, you know, didn't make this representation. We interviewed the White House Counsel's Office, National Security Advisors. We've we've interviewed everyone who ever worked for you, Donald Trump. None of them said that you designated these as personal. So, you know, he, he basically accused him of inventing this and told uh, and told Judge Cannon, figure it out because, and figure it out early because if you don't, we're appealing and he's going to move to get her recused off this case because she does not know what she's doing. Yeah. So the, the, I agree with all that. The reassignment process, uh, which I have a hot take on, is um, they got to, they got to show at the 11th Circuit that what she's done so far satisfies three factors of a case called Torkington in the 11th Circuit, which is based on a Second Circuit case, um, which basically says, has this judge, um, because of their decision making, basically painted themselves in a corner so that they are doubling down on wrongheaded decisions in the past in their, uh, in their current decision making and therefore that is undermining the administration of justice. The answer to that factor is yes. She's made a series of wrong decisions in this case, starting from her interference pre-indictment with the prosecution or the investigation of the case, uh, and had been reprimanded twice by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, um, even before this case became a case in terms of an indictment. And she's made a series of mistakes about the Classified Information and Procedures Act, which is at the heart of the case, and now making fundamental error about, for all to see, as called out by Jack Smith, about uh, whether the Presidential Records Act provides a defense to Espionage Act, which it doesn't, can't, uh, or to the obstruction of justice count at the heart of the case. So if they can show that the Torkington factors, that one, um, that the administration of justice won't be impaired by her removal. How could it be? She hasn't made any real decisions. The case is sitting in in a, in a suspended animation without having been set for trial. The argument would run the other way. You put a new judge in there, that new judge would come in very quickly, survey the landscape, figure out there were a handful of motions that needed to be resolved now, <clears throat> set the case for trial, and then work backwards from there for a very efficient pretrial practice and motion practice and jury uh, jury information or jury um, instruction practice and get the case tried, which is the goal. You wouldn't know it for those that watch us, that this is the goal of the federal court is actually to efficiently try cases and get to their conclusion and for justice. You wouldn't know it by the way Judge Cannon is doing. And that is the essence of asking for reassignment. It happens rarely. Florida has a, a lemon law. It's basically three, it's like three strikes, you know, three defects by the judge and she gets recalled. <laughs> Bring her back in. It's like Westworld. You know, we need, you know, two guys are going to come in and take Judge Cannon away with white lab coats and replace her with somebody that actually knows what they're doing. And this, um, this is it, man. And the way that you've outlined exactly how J Jack Smith has fired, there's a reason he wrote an entire brief on this. It's not because he thinks he's going to be able to talk her out of it and talk her off the ledge or talk her into reconsidering. It's because he's setting a, a he's establishing the record for his eventual soon to be appeal. And in there, he's going to catalog all of the misfirings and mistakes that she has made that go to fundamental clear error and the um, and the. Um, undermining of our criminal justice system as it relates to this case. Fundamental, um, reversible error. 
and he will catalog all of them, cite the Torkington factors that the court should apply, and not only ask that she be appealed and or instructed and given a mandate on how to properly run the case, but that she be reassigned. And they're going to have to think long and hard about it. I'm not sure the 11th Circuit, at least the current uh, uh, group of it, uh, led by Judge William Pryor sitting in Atlanta, um, can think of too many other cases and certainly not ones of high profile and national security involving a former president, of course, in which a judge has made so many, so many fundamental, reversible, clear errors and miscarriages of justice. And now faced with that, they're going to have to figure out what the 11th Circuit stands for. What does it stand for? They have the inherent authority and power as the 11th Circuit and the bosses of their trial court level people to reassign them. They, there's, there's a couple of rules uh, right on the books, statutory rules that allow them to do exactly that for the proper administration of justice, not just issue mandates, not just coaching counsel, not just reverse and send back for further, for further orders or further proceedings, but actually reassign. And I can't think of a better case than that. The entire world is watching what the 11th Circuit and this, in this case, uh, the Southern District of Florida is doing. And I am sure, I, I'm sorry, um, I know a number of these judges on the, not only the 11th Circuit, but on the Southern District of Florida, many of them came up from the trial court, the state court level where I practice frequently. And I know that for a fact, well, not for a fact, I, I, I can suppose that they are slapping their foreheads about what Judge Cannon was like if I, and wishing that they had the case. People that have been on the bench for five and 10 and 15 and 20 years who have been judges for 15, 20, or 30 years, who know what they're doing and understand the rules, understand the Constitution, and understand how to have uh, how the things are briefed and have good law clerks. You know, we did some reporting on Midas Touch recently. She can't even keep a law clerk. And the law clerks do most of the writing and research related to opinions. And she can't seem to keep one. She had two leave in December, which is quite unusual. She hasn't been able to replace them. She's shorthanded. I assume she's doing her own work, which is, e which is equally scary. Give it 11th Circuit. This is my plea. Give the case to one of the other just judges. And I know you can think of one in the 11th Circuit in Southern District of Florida who's more qualified to handle this case and get this case tried. The public justice requires it, right? Public have a stake and or have a seat at the table when it comes to trials. It's not just the right of the accused for a, to a, a fair trial. It's the right of the public. That's why things are not done generally sealed. They're done in the open. It's the right of the public to observe a criminal process to its conclusion. We don't do secret trials. We don't do star chambers, uh, except in rare circumstances. Um, and we, <laughs> it's not a war tribunal. We're supposed to know what's going on at any given moment. We're supposed to really understand it. And the question for, under the Torkington factors is also, if a, if a lay person who's not a lawyer possessing of all the facts that I've just outlined, Karen has outlined, would believe that there's an appearance of justice being undermined, then the judge needs to go. And I'm sorry, I don't care which side of the aisle you sit. I don't know how you can objectively, as a lay person, not even as a lawyer, go through the facts I've just outlined and come away with a conclusion that the appearance of propriety hasn't been compromised here or that the appearance of justice not being done isn't isn't in the air isn't in isn't in the ether, in the ether it is and so i implore the 11th circuit when Do when jack smith deems it's time and we trusted him so far to do the right thing and he brings it to the 11th circuit's um attention well if you like lawyers talking about things they know what they're talking about at the intersection of law and politics one place legal af if you want to know what the title means, join us on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the Midas Touch Network and then on audio podcast platforms of your choice. If you know everything you need to know about Legal AF, you're already part of our audience. We really thank you from the bottom of our heart. Take that clip. You can be part of our marketing department. Send it off to friends and family and say, hey, <laughs> just do it like that. Hey, you know that show Legal AF I, I tell you all about? Here's an example of it. Maybe they'll join. 
and join our audience, which will be great for us and for you. You can you guys can talk about it and have a little coffee clutch about it. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, who I am, or et cetera, I'm Michael Popak. That was Legal AF. Join us on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And free subscribe to the Midas Touch Network and help them get to 3 million subscribers before the election day. So until my next hot take, until my next Legal AF, this is Michael Popak reporting. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.